And that's a Bible promise that we've been claiming, and I believe that it's been happening in the lives of those of us who have been taking this journey with God. And you know, the funny thing about a journey with God is, it's not necessarily an easy journey, is it? There's tests along the way, challenges, and um, we believe the Bible teaches about an enemy, Satan, who doesn't want us to draw near to God. And he'll do anything he can to put a wedge in there. And one of his favorite wedges is called busyness. And another one of his favorite wedges is called money. And tonight's topic is looking at money. Money can be a wedge between us and God, but it can also be a real blessing. And we all need money to live. And, uh, you know, the world that we live in, um, is, money is a real thing. And it might be a surprise for some of you to realize how much Jesus taught about money. And so tonight um, we're going to be looking at what Jesus says about money. But before we get on to that, I just want to let you know about what we have coming up. Tomorrow's message is going to be a terrific one. We're looking forward to William, who's going to be teaching us about what Jesus says about heaven, which is a really encouraging topic. So come and enjoy that tomorrow. And of course, we start at 9 o'clock for our pancakes, as usual, and then right through until 10.45 for our session after an hour of Bible study. So come along tomorrow, what Jesus says about heaven. And a lot of people misunderstand heaven. They think it's like floating in the clouds, watering pot plants. I was reading this Bible story to my little three-year-old called Who is Jesus? And it was all really accurate until the last page where it had a picture of Jesus and it's saying that he's in heaven looking after us. I had this drawing with a man, Jesus, with his feet on the earth and his torso wrapped in a cloud and I don't know what, smiling or something like that. That, and I said to Hannah, that is not heaven. The picture is wrong. <laughs> and so tomorrow we're going to learn about what Jesus actually says about heaven. It's a real physical place. And um, we're going to get to go there um, as we connect with our Lord and God. So that's something to look forward to. I'm not sure why, but I think I can hear my voice coming through something. These speakers here are repeating something back to me. I don't know why that is. Um, yeah. It's like a little delay or some, some other voice. Anyway, we'll get to the bottom of it. It's not doing it right now, but I'll tell you if it starts doing it again. I think we might have fixed it. Anyhow, so apart from tomorrow's topic, let me tell you about my thing that I'm most excited about, and that is we've got another series coming up. And so some of us have, well, we've all enjoyed this series, What Jesus Says About, but where do we go next? It's not as if God's plan for us is to stop seek, drawing near to him because we got to the end of the series tomorrow. And so I've been praying as the pastor here at Garden City, you know, God, what do you want us to do? And I believe that um, we've, he's given me a great leading, and so I've put together a special series that's going to take us between now and Christmas time. It's a 10-part series. There's no midweek mornings. It's all Saturday presentations, so either here in the morning or at Hornby in the afternoon. And our Tongan congregation is going to be doing the same series as well. And it's called First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. And you might think that's an unusual name for a series. Well, it's on those books of the Bible. And so as a church, we're going to read through those four books of the Bible and there'll be 10 different messages taken from those books of the Bible. And those books of the Bible are some of the places where you're going to find the most exciting and fun stories in the whole Bible. Also some of the most incredible teaching and lessons learned from the people in those books of the Bible. You would have heard of many of the people in those books of the Bible before. This is where you're going to read about the story of David and Goliath. You'll read about King Saul. You'll read about King Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, and the man who wrote the book of Proverbs. You're going to learn about Elijah the prophet, who called down fire from heaven and it burned up this sacrifice on the top of Mount Carmel in front of 700 prophets of Baal. All these great stories are found in these four books of the Bible. So, Join us on that adventure as we go through these books of the Bible together, seeking God, continuing to draw near to him. And so um, you'll hear more about that tomorrow. You're going to get given a special Bible reading guide that's going to show you what chapters to read of the Bible each week. And I'll just give you a heads up. The first one is Samuel chapter 1 to 8. 
that's what you can start reading in preparation for next Saturday. So there we go. This evening, it's a real privilege to give a warm welcome to our speaker. And um, our speaker tonight is frequently preaching over in the Bishopdale Seventh-day Adventist Church, but also in all kinds of other spots around the world. Lately, he's been in the North Island and down in Invercargill, I think, all just in the last month, preaching God's word and teaching. And so it's a real privilege to give a warm welcome tonight to Ray Moaga. Let's put our hands together. Come on up, Ray. Thanks for joining us, Ray. Thanks, Ray. Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Oh, very good. It's, uh, it's a bit cold in this uh, auditorium, but that's all right. With your smiles, I'm sure we'll be able to warm up. So on a count of three, give me a biggest smile that you can ever do. One, two, three. Yeah. There you go. Now I want you to turn around and give an, another person in this auditorium a big smile as well. We need, a, we need big smiles tonight. <laughs> that's awesome. I have a question. Let's see if this thing works. Here we go. Is there anything, is there anything in this world that would cause you to give up the gospel? Is there anything in this world that will cause you to give up the gospel? The gospel means what? The good news. So we've discovered that the good news is who? Jesus. And Jesus taught that while we're still sinners, this is the gospel, that Christ died for the ungodly. Then he rose again, giving the promise of eternal life and abundant life. This is awesome, right? And he gave it life to his disciples. So what could inspire someone to give up this good news? What could inspire someone to trade it all in? Is there anything in this world that your heart so desires that you'll be willing to take the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus and trade it in and exchange him for your desire. Judas was one of the disciples. In fact, he, he traveled with Jesus everywhere in, 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 in all the Gospels. You would see Judas you know, with Jesus. He saw Jesus perform the miracles. He saw Jesus with the healings. He would hear Jesus speak with authority. You know, he, he would be with, the, with those who were in need. He'll, he'll be with those of teachers of the law. Judas was basically everywhere with Jesus. But when it came down to it, when it came down to the heart of the matter, Judas was willing to take the life of Jesus and exchange it for what? 30 pieces of silver for money. Now let's not quickly discount the story because sometimes it's, it's, it's easy to go point at Judas and say, well, Judas was a bad man and I would never be put in that situation. I'd always choose the gospel and I'd always choose Jesus. However, let's pause. In fact, let's back up just for a quick second here. Because sometimes, and there are some of us, who could easily walk in the path of Judas. You don't understand? Let me paint you a picture. The disciples and Jesus were sitting around the table at the Last Supper. And Jesus declares to his disciples, says, one of you will betray me. Now, it's interesting, this story. Did, did the disciples turn around and look at um, Judas and say, well, it's going to be him? They didn't. In fact, they looked confused. They were in shock. They're like, Lord, who is it? Lord, who is it? And they were just as confused as Judas was, as Jesus was. Jesus wasn't confused. But they were. And it's interesting because when we think about Judas, he looked like one of the disciples. He talked like one of the disciples. He acted like one of the disciples. However, however, when it came down to it, this is what made him different. He was willing to trade the life of Jesus for money. He wasn't the only person, though. When we look through the Gospels and the stories again, we find a Roman soldier, in fact, Roman soldiers, who also exchanged the life of Jesus or the hope of the gospel of Jesus for a sum of money. And in Matthew 28, 11 to 15, uh, if you were able to read it tonight or in, in your own personal readings, I'm not going to read through an entire thing, but this is just a snippet of what I wanted to pull out. So the story goes that um, the women had just uh, seen Jesus and had spoken to him, and they were going back to the disciples to tell uh, them about what had happened at that seen Jesus. And there were some soldiers who happened to be nearby, 
conveniently. And they overheard and they knew. So on, as they went to the temple to talk to the chief priests now, they go to the chief priests and say, hey, this is what's happened. Apparently Jesus is alive. Then the chief priests turn around and basically bribe these soldiers and said, take this money and, and, and basically tell everyone that this did not happen. And in fact, tell them that someone came away in the middle of the night and stole Jesus' body. And that's why he's not there. He's not actually alive. They just pinched his body and that's it. But the key passage that I want to just select just here, and it emphasizes again, that these soldiers, although they knew about the life, the death, and now the resurrection of Jesus, Right here in the yellow. Let's just read together in the yellow. One, two, three. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very, very day. Interesting. And the scary thing is that some of us are chasing that sum of money as well. It may not be physically chasing a sum of money or the, or the actual paper itself. But we too experience that chase of money. We have the life, the death, and resurrection of Christ. And these are all major workings of the gospel. I believe that. And as weighty, as criti and weighty and critical as these truths are, God is showing us the inclination of what? The human heart when it comes to our finances. The willingness to throw it all out the window to exchange it for money. So what will you do? What will you do? There's a television show in Australia. I spent many years in, in Australia as, as a young person. And uh, there's a television show that is called Deal or No Deal. I don't know if you've seen that show here. And it's, and it's quite exciting, isn't it? I think uh, you know, I can already see smiles on people's faces. It's just hilarious. People are willing to, 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 to gamble and take risks and say, oh, I want, I want this amount of money. And you're sort of tempted if the host is prompting your you know, provoking you to, hey, you should risk it all, oh, deal or no deal. But what would you do? What would you do if you were given a briefcase on this television show? And in that briefcase, it had, you know, the, I don't know what the max amount is. Is it 500,000 or something like that? 200,000? I don't know what $200,000 looks like. I wish I had that in my bank account. But what would you do if, if the host came to you with that briefcase and opened it up and says, here's $200,000, you've won it. Now, would you trade that for the life, death, and resurrection of Christ? Would you trade that for Jesus, your Savior? Interesting question. Now, by now, you should get an understanding or an idea that Jesus spoke a lot about finances. In fact, he spoke a lot about money. Now, why is it that he spoke a lot more about money than faith, prayer, heaven, and hell combined? Interesting, isn't it? He spoke about this a lot more than these uh, other topics. And what was it about money that makes it so dangerous? Money promise, promises us to give everything that our hearts desire. There's a song that was written by a group by the name of Abba. You know the song? Money, money, money is so funny in a rich man's world. Money. It promises to give us everything that our hearts desire. Money promises power, comfort, love, and approval. If you agree with me, just nod. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Indeed it does. We love money because we have, we, we love money because we love the idols it promises it gives us. Because it promises to satisfy our deepest needs, longings, and yearnings of the human heart. So Jesus just doesn't treat this word money with, you know, with little emphasis. He, he, he doesn't just go, well, it's just a little thing and, and, and it doesn't really matter. In fact, he stresses it because it's about the effect that money has on mastering and consuming our lives. We have a desire for it in our hearts naturally. We all do. I definitely do. It's a master that desires exclusive worship and submission. So when God commands us to give, it's not because he wants your money. He wants what? Your heart. Turn to the person next to you and say, he wants your heart. 
He wants your heart, yes. So it looks like this. This is how the struggle looks like when it comes to our finances. And this is God's you know, and, 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 and Jesus longing for us. There's a seesaw battle. I experienced that between Jesus wanting my heart or the money. And you're going, oh, which one is more? Which one is, you know, I, uh, just a few days ago, I, uh, I experienced uh, this, uh, this tension in my heart. Um, I was riding my, my mountain bike the other day. And as I was riding my mountain bike, I thought to myself, man, it would be awesome if I, if I purchased another bike. So I got home and I, 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 I went up to my wife and I sort of tried to, you know, trying to sell her the idea. I was like, babe, this is an amazing idea. I've just, I've just got a, a great idea. I think I should get another bike. Now, for us blokes and husbands, you know, we all know that look, that look of disapproval. But, you know, the wife doesn't say it. She just turned around and went, mm-hmm. And I thought straight away, I was like, okay, there's something wrong here. <laughs> Maybe I need to think about what I just said. Anyway, I, I, I disappeared for half an hour and I was doing some housework and I came back later on. And I, and I think, you know, the Holy Spirit prompted me and said, that's a want, not a need. <laughs> that's a want, not a need. And I told my wife, I said, you know what, don't worry about the bike. It's a, it's a want, not a need. And again, she gave the same look. Mm-hmm. It's almost like she said, I told you so. <laughs> and she didn't even say anything. <laughs> but when God commands us to be generous, this is the battle, that when God commands us to be generous and to be giving, it's not because he wants to take, thing, uh, take things from you. He wants to give us himself. God doesn't want the money out of our pockets. He doesn't want our literal money in our pockets. I mean, he doesn't need you know, five cents and 50 cents that we, you know, we try and give to him. He doesn't actually need the physical money from our pockets. He wants the idols out of our heart that we desire for with the money, isn't it? Giving money should be the hardest and easiest thing in the world. The hardest because you're basically getting rid of the idols of your heart, but the easiest because you're giving to the one who what? Who's the giver, who gives you everything. So what does Jesus say about finances? There's a few things that he does say about finances, and, and, and it got me going because when I began to look into this talk and, 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 and realize that financial security isn't about me, it's about a relationship with him. It's not about me and my coins and my, you know, and my $20 notes or whatever it is, my bank account. It's not, it's not about me, it's actually about him. Because Jesus says, get to know me, put me first, seek me first, and I'll promise you to give you the ultimate security. Now, there's nowhere in the Bible, you can Google this, you can research it yourself, there's nowhere in the Bible where it says, if you, or where Jesus says, if you obey me, I'll make you a millionaire. Nowhere, you can, I can guarantee you that. There is nowhere in the Bible where you find that. However, some places do teach that, and some churches do teach that. However, he does promise to give us ultimate security if we put him first. He is promising us a home in heaven, as uh, William will speak about tomorrow, and promising to take care of our needs in this world as well. So Jesus taught about financial stress. He did. He taught about financial stress. You're probably scratching your head going, where does he talk about this word financial stress? Well, he teaches his disciples that you can live a worry-free life. He did. Imagine it. No more worries about finances. If you agree with me, I'll just raise your hand. Like, I, I wish I don't want to worry about finances ever, ever again. Ah, and this is where he says, Matthew 6, 25 to 34, it says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body. What you will wear is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes. Later on, he says, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? But seek first what? His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. So therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for what? Tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough, what? Trouble of its own. Turn to the person next to you and say, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. 
Reminds me of a song of Bob Marley, Don't Worry About a Thing. Yeah? Every little thing's going to be all right. So Jesus talks about financial, uh, talks about financial uh, stress. And he says, don't worry, I got this, I got it under control. He also taught about priorities when it comes to our finances as well. And Jesus knew that we will be inclined to struggle with making money our top priority. He knew that. And I sometimes feel I relate to this picture. If, if you sort of know the origins of this picture, this is a cheeky little take on this picture. This is a picture that's painted by Michelangelo. And it's, and it's of the, the famous hand of God reaching out to Adam. But, you know, some clever person decided to throw, well, I'll throw in a wad of money there. Something that separates us from God. Can you relate? I can definitely relate. So Jesus knew that we would struggle making money our top priority. He knew we would struggle making him first and putting our money uh, to him first. So he addressed it. And he says this. He says, no one can what? Serve two masters. Either you will hate one or love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both what? God or, and, and, and money. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve two masters. So the challenge is there for us uh, tonight, he's saying, hey, do you trust me? We're going to see this word come over and over again in, in, in our talk this evening. He says, do you trust me with your finances? Do you trust me with your stability in life or instability in life? Jesus also encourages us about responsibility with our money. So we have our money, whatever we have, and says, okay, so how does he teach us to be responsible? And he didn't just want us to trust him and, and, um, and, and throw it all in the wind and say, Jesus, here it all is. I'm going to do whatever you want me to do. I'm going to sell off everything. No, he says, be responsible. Be smart about it. And he uses many of his parables to talk about the responsibility of our finances. Number one, he teaches in one of these parables, he says he teaches us common sense with financial planning and budgeting. Now, if you're anything like me, I hate these two words, planning and budgeting, more so budgeting. <laughs> I, uh, I, have, I, I, I will admit I have, uh, you know, uh, I sort of like have a, what, an itchy hand when it comes to buying stuff online. You know, there's a website called uh, Treat Me and Daily Do and Grab One, and often they, they give you these deals. Hey, for $6, you can buy a burrito. I was like, oh, yeah, why not? And I click away, buy it. Oh, for $7, you can buy an 18-hole pup. But oh, yeah, yeah, why not? Click away. And then what I begin to realize is that when I look at my bank account, it's sort of, you know, slowly going like this. <laughs> then I get in trouble because my wife says, what's, what's all these little purchases that you're buying? And she says, we need to be careful how we spend our money. A friend of mine once told me, he says, look after the cents and the dollars will take care of itself. So true. Look after your cents and the dollars will take care of itself. But he talks about uh, common sense and financial planning with budgeting as well. Where does he say this? It says in Luke 14, verse 28. And this is basically uh, him explaining. He says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? He's saying, if you're going to, if you're going to uh, use your money wisely, estimate, ask, investigate, research. Don't just go out and just spend it all. Planning is effective. Planning is necessary. Budgeting is effective. Budgeting is effective. Now, I know here at Garden City Fellowship, they, you often offer courses um, which, which really help in, in, in this area. How else does T uh, Jesus encourage us about dealing with our money responsibly? In the second parable, he says you need to learn to be shrewd with money. In essence, he's basically saying you need to be smart about it. Be sensible about it. Be wise about the way you spend your money. And in Luke 16, 1 to 12, again, we're, not going to only, we're only going to read a s small section of this, uh, of this passage. But the story goes there was a rich man who had a manager. Apparently, he got bad word from, from others that the manager was either overspending or wasn't looking after the rich man's finances. So what had happened was he calls the manager, I say, into his office and says, I hear that you've been uh, not the best manager. And the manager's like, I'm so sorry. Let me make it up for you. 
So he goes away and he, and he goes to all the people who owe uh, money to his, to, to his boss, to this rich man. And he approaches them individually and says, how much do you owe? And he goes, oh, well, I, I owe this much. And he says, well, half, half that and I'll take that and give it back to my boss. He goes to the next person, does exactly the same, half that and I'll give it back to you. The rich man finds out what he's doing and says, man, you're, you're sensible now. Before you weren't so sensible, but now you are. And we come to this passage right at the end, and the, manager, uh, the rich man says to this manager, he says, whoever can be trusted with little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. Being smart about our money. Being wise about our money. This is what the emphasis is. He says, don't just go out and spend it and overspend and do it. Be, be, be mindful of it. Jesus also taught about investing money. So again, getting a good return or even a basic return on money over time. Sounds like a financial sort of workshop we're running here tonight, isn't it? <laughs> but you see where it stems from. Where? The Bible. <laughs> People are coming up with all these new theories. Hey, did you know if you invest? It's like, well, actually, Jesus said it first. <laughs> But here's an example in Matthew 25, 14 to 30. Again, uh, this is the 521 story, and, I, and the reason why I call it the 521 story, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a master who goes to his servants and he gives five, uh, five bags of gold to one, two bags of gold to another, and one bag of gold to the other. And he says basically, okay, here it is, see what you do with it. So what happens in the story is that the guy with the five, what did he do? He invested it, he, and, and, and he got double back, so he got ten. The second guy did the same thing, doubled that, and he got, what, four. But the last guy who, who received the one, he was like, well, I'm not going to do anything with it. I'm too scared. I'm just going to bury it and leave it as it is. So when the master returns back and he approaches all these guys and says, okay, guys, let's see what you did with the money. The first guy says, okay, what did you do? He goes, oh, look, I doubled him. And then what he says here, he goes, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Second guy, same thing again. He goes, what did you do? He goes, well, I invested it, and I got double back. I gave you four. says again, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of much. Approaches the last guy. He says, what did you do? And basically he says, well, well, well I, was, I was scared. And I didn't really want to invest, so I, I just sat on it. I buried it, and now I'm giving you back the one. But notice what the master says. Because you think, hey, well, he held on to the gold. He didn't, he didn't lose it. But he turns around, and in yellow, what does he say? He goes, you wicked and lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I return, I would have received it back with interest. So he said, even the, 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 the smart thing to do would have just went, hey, give it to someone else and they can do the investing for you. But instead he sits on it. He sits on it. But Jesus encourages us to invest our money getting a good return over time. And this is great financial you know, ad ad advice. <coughs> Number four, he teaches in another parable on fulfilling our financial obligations. The Pharisees approach Jesus, or the teachers of the law approach Jesus, and they say, to whom do we pay the taxes? And right here, Jesus talks to them um, and says, basically, he says, they brought him a, a denarius, a coin, and he asked them, he says, whose image is on the coin? Whose inscription? And they said, it's Caesar's. It's Caesar's coin. Then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and give back to God what is God. What is the emphasis here? Fulfilling our financial obligations. Fulfilling our financial obligations. If, you know, uh, just, just today, I, I called up uh, IRD <laughs> and I had to claim back my tax return. I was a bit disappointed that was little, but... Again, the responsible thing is to claim it back and be, a, and be a good citizen. Again, Jesus is emphasizing, says, hey, fulfill our financial obligations. Give back, you know, pay your taxes, do what's right. Don't be stingy and start hiding away and, you know. But it's interesting because he also taught about inspirational giving. 
to be giving from the heart, what it means to actually give not only with your physical money, but also with your heart as well. And the story is of the rich young ruler. You would have heard this story uh, in, in either in church or time and time again. But let me speed it up for a second here. It says a man, a rich young ruler, came up to Jesus and says in the yellow, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? He says, why do you ask me what is good? Jesus replied, there's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? This young man inquired. Jesus replied, you should not murder, uh, commit adultery, steal, give false testimony, honor your father and your mother, love your neighbor as yourself. And the rich young man says, I've, I've, I've kept all these. And of course he had, because this, this, and historically, this rich young man was educated. He knew the law. He knew the scriptures. So he did everything. He ticked all the boxes. But then Jesus challenges him again. He says, well, let me check your heart. And he asks him, he goes, if you want to be perfect, if you want to be with me, he goes, go sell your possessions and give it to who? Give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And we know how the story ends. He walks away with his head down and realizing that his heart, his idol was attached to what? Money. His stuff. And when he was asked to give it up, he was like, no, 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 no. I want to hold on to this. I want to hold on to this. But Jesus also taught a principle, a spiritual principle on return on investment. I love this. You maybe uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you to help me out with this, uh, with this statement. Finish it off for me. Give and it will... Yeah. Or another version, give and it will come back to you. Give and it will be given to you. We all know this principle, right? And it's an important one. Why? Because Jesus knew that this was to be one of the very principles that God's kingdom is based upon. Rather than a kingdom where giving is forced, he longed to see his followers filled with love and compassion that inspired practical help for one another as well as generosity that will see the gospel message spread. Give and it will be given to you. That's a promise. He says, if you give me, I will give back. Hey, that sounds like a good deal. But then often we like to give more and expect more. Oh, well, I'm going to give even more than before, then I'm going to expect more blessings in return. But here's a, here's a reality check. We cannot outgive God. We cannot outgive God. He taught the principle that we cannot outgive Him. God is the ultimate source of love and good things. Why? Because we love him because he first loved us. It's because of his love for us that we are compelled to love him back, to give back to him. So when we give from a loving heart, it doesn't go unnoticed. It will ultimately result in a blessing coming back to us. Now, this is not why we give. Let me correct myself here. It's not we give in order to receive, you know. This is not why we give, but it will happen when we give, when we're led by God's spirit of love. We give out of love. So the big question is tonight for you and I, as we are finishing up. So how much should we give to God? How much should we give to God? Well, if, if you, if, I guess if I was to talk to my 19-year-old uh, self, what's the minimum that I should give to God? And if this is the question that I, I would have asked myself, this shows that I haven't yet grasped the full concept of, and the full purpose of the spirit of giving. The Bible does give us some guidance. Indeed it does. And Jesus affirmed that tithing was a command. It was a command. And that God had given his people to offer a tenth of what they had to God and he would give it back to them. So notice here, is God saying, give me a tenth. This is a biblical principle. And God gave this command to the children. of Israel. If you give me this small little bit, I'll give you it back. Now everything that comes from him in the first place, everything that comes from, from God in, in the first place, so why would he want it back? If God wants us to have this stuff, why would he ask for, 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 for it back? My wife had, a, had an incident when she was younger where her brother bought her a present for, for her, uh, I think it was 18th uh, birthday. And he bought her this nice SLR camera, really fancy at the time. 
And she was really excited and said, wow, thank you so much for this gift. I love you, brother. Oh, more, more, more. You're the best brother ever, and so on and so on. A few days later, he comes to her bedroom door. She opens the door. She's playing with her camera. And he says to her, well, you know that camera that I gave to you for your birthday? And she's like, yeah, thanks so much for that. He goes, can I have it back? <laughs> <laughs> He goes, I've I realized I actually need that camera and I, I need to do a few projects with it. True story, you can ask her whenever you see her. It's just, when we think about this example, it's like, why would God, you know, give something but then want it back? Unfortunately, God doesn't work like the way that uh, her, 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 her brother did. But the whole purpose of this is so that we would know that it all came from Him and if we trust Him enough, it will come back. So we give a tenth back because we know this. The tithing command asks if you believe that God gave you all that you need and all that you have and that you trust him to provide you with all that you need and all that you have. So when we're giving offerings, we're saying, we're so grateful, God. We thank you so much. I thank you. I'm giving this back to you. And I choose you because of this. And we are moved to worship him out of the overflow of our giving and our trust of him. So Jesus recognized this as an important principle, indeed. That giving, that he highlighted that someone can often give, but you can also miss the whole point of giving. You can also miss the whole point of giving. Hold on to that thought. And he demonstrates this, because he talks to these teachers of the law, who were all about looking good, ticking the boxes, doing the right thing, Making sure that people were, you know, he was, you know, that they were seeing doing the right thing. But he turns around to these teachers of the law and he says, Woe to you, teachers of the law, Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, which is what he asked for, a tenth. But then he says, But you have neglected more important matters of the law, which was justice, mercy, having compassion, and faithfulness. He says, You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. They're saying basically here, it goes hand in hand. He wasn't so much concerned about the actual physical uh, offering or, 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 or the physical money. He was more concerned about what? Their heart, again. Their heart. And I love this picture because it says what? Money, the, the, the heart should be greater than your love for money. But that's not always the case, and that's challenging for us sometimes. But in Malachi 3, this is a verse that we often come across when it comes to finances. It says that, Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me, he says. But you ask, how are we robbing God in tithes and offerings? You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. He's talking to the, uh, the children of Israel. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse where uh, there may be food in my house. But then God says, test me then in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be no room enough, uh, there will be not enough room enough to store it. Test me, he says. Test me. Trust me. Test me. All I want is your 10, and I'll give you above and beyond what you can ever imagine. The heart of a father is to always give. And that's the essence of what I want to say tonight. The heart of the father is to want to give to you tonight. Not the physical money, which is, which is good, but it's the heart. He wants your financial stability to be in him tonight. This is a picture of my daughter. I know, she looks like me, right? No, she doesn't. <laughs> well, I hope so. Somewhere, I think she looks more like uh, my wife. But this is my daughter, Lola Jane. She's uh, eight months old. No, seven months old. And, and that's, that's me, by the way, in case you're wondering. So who's this strange man holding her? That's, that's me. So my heart as a father is to want to give her the best of everything. You know, the best toys the best clothes, the best shoes. She's, she's our firstborn, so of course I'm going to spoil her rotten, right? 
And already she's banking up a collection of toys. I haven't bought many of them, but many have been donated to us by friends and family. And again, her, 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 her toys are just stacking up in our house. Uh, you know, before I could move around, all of a sudden I'm tripping over toys and spraining my ankle and whatnot. But my heart is to give Lola Jane the best of everything. However, as she grows up and I begin to see that her behavior changes when it comes to her toys and people enter the house or other children enter the house. And all of a sudden she begins to be greedy with her toys and start pushing kids away and saying, no, this is mine, 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 mine. And after a while, if she's, if she's beginning to, to do this, it would, be, it would be negligent for me to keep buying her more toys. It would be negligent for me to keep buying her more toys. On the other hand, if I see that she's sharing and she's happy and she's willing to donate her toys to everyone and want everyone to play with her, it makes me want to buy her more toys. Now let's look at the picture of God here. It's exactly the same. God wants to give us the best of everything. But he also wants us to use it responsibly as well. And freely and generously as well. So these hands, Jesus says, your hands. I want you to look at your hands tonight. Just look at your hands. You can also look at the person next to you, their hands. <laughs> Examine their hands. There's nothing in it at the moment. <laughs> but look at these hands. And I want you to repeat after me, looking at your hands. You are blessed. Actually, no, I am blessed to be a blessing. Turn to the person next to you and say, you are blessed with these hands to be a blessing. And we are. While some of us might read Malachi 3 and said, wow, if we give to God, of course, prosperity gospel is where he's just going to give us all back. Yeah. But that's not how God works. Because Jesus makes it very clear. It is God who has given us our first, who has given first to us. And our giving is to be heartfelt, a heartfelt response to that. We received such a blessing in Jesus Christ because of the gospel. We received the gospel not because we obeyed. We didn't receive it because we obeyed or we, or we gave the right amount. But rather, in Ephesians it says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from who? It's not from us. It is the gift of God. Not by works, not by our giving, so that no one can boast. No one can boast. So how do we respond to a truth like this in light of our topic tonight? What should our giving look like in light of that? So what is the better question to ask? How much must I give or how much can I give? How much must I give or how much can I give? So here he is with his open hands, giving us his, uh, you know, Jesus' open hands is a demonstration. It's our demonstration especially. It's a posture of surrender isn't it? And it's the very posture that did this in surrender. But it's our experience of the gospel and, re and we receive it and we understand it now, what it means to give our hearts to God. So we give to the missions because the gospel says that when Jesus died on the cross, he had people in mind from every tongue and every nation. When we give to the church because Jesus gave to the church, and we give up our first fruits and tithe because God gave his first fruit, Jesus, to the church. We give to orphan or charities because we're reminded of ourselves that while we're orphans and charitable gazers, Jesus came to take us to his Father, to adopt us as his own. When we give to the poor and needy, we are pointing to the truth that says, when we are poor, Jesus came to meet our needs. So Jesus gave to the point of sacrifice, as you see here, motivated by his love for us. There is a, a survey that took place in America, and it basically says, on average, 
there's only 2.58 uh, um, of church members give their tithe. Let me just pause on that for a second. Let you think about that. That they give away 2.58, sorry, of their salary. And then 25% of the average church member gives nothing at all. What does this tell us? Perhaps it points out to us, uh, to, to, to us how much people are in need of a true connection with Jesus, the true giver. There's real love in giving when you feel like you have absolutely nothing. Our giving starts not when we get a job. Our giving starts when we understand that we are saved. One last story. It's of a widow, of a lady, and Jesus and his disciples are sitting down, and they see, and they see this, uh, this procession of people, and they're going into the temple treasury and, and they're putting their offerings and their money in. Many of the rich people they see putting them large amounts of money. Then they see this, 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 this widow goes up to the box and drops in a few copper coins. Then Jesus calls his disciples, calls his disciples and says, Truly I tell you, this poor woman, this poor widow, has put more into the treasury than any of the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she gave out of her poverty. She put in everything, all that she had to live on. And God doesn't need our money, our physical money. Because if he did, he would be much happier with large sums of money piled up. But because his desire is not your money, but your heart tonight, he sees the widow and is more pleased with that. So we look at the widow and seeing her as being foolish and go, well, she gave it all. She shouldn't have done that. How is she going to survive for the rest of the week? But she gave out of her poverty because she knew that her treasure was found in heaven and found in Jesus Christ. Tonight, I believe, I believe that God is asking us to make us a choice, for us to make a choice tonight, to trust him with our lives to trust them with our finances as well. And we have an opportunity to express that choice tonight. William is uh, coming around now to d distribute some, uh, some cards. But as we, um, before we get there, I want to read to you one more last promise before we finish up this evening. In Matthew 6, 19 to 21, Jesus says, do not store up yourselves treasures on earth. He says, where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. So the question is for you and I tonight, where does your heart lie? Where are your treasures? On the response card you are given now, there are three uh, boxes, three opportunities to respond to tonight's message. Number one, you may tick if you say, hey, Jesus, help me. Help me to manage my money in a way that honors you. I may be a bit reckless and careless with my money, but I want to I manage my money in a way that gives you glory. Or you may tick the second box where it says, Jesus, help me to give to others in a way that reflects your generosity to me. So I want to give because you have given me. I want to bless others because you have been a blessing to me. And if that is you, tick this box. Or you may tick the third one, which is, Jesus, I want to honor you by returning a tithe of my income. My little 10%, my wee little 10%, I want to give that to you into your storehouse. And Jesus says, okay, you do that. Watch what I do with your little 10%. I will open up the floodgates. I will pour so much of a blessing that you have no idea what to do with all, all of it. So how about it, folks? The question is tonight, will you trust them? Will you trust Jesus with your financial security?
Will you trust him with your heart? Will you trust him and believe that he can provide? We have definitely been schooled tonight, and Jesus has shown us through the stories and said, hey, I'm in control here. I'm in control here. But lay your treasure with me. Lay your treasure with me. Let's pray. Father God, tonight we just thank you so much again that you have opened our hearts and have you opened our minds to what it means to truly have great joy and security in you, Jesus. You have shown us in our, in, our, in our presentation tonight that you do care about us. You care about the big things in our lives, but you also care about the little things in our lives. You care about the big finances in our lives, but you also care about the little finances in our lives. Jesus, you have shown to us time and time again for us to not worry, to put our absolute trust in you. And there are some of us here tonight as we have ticked these boxes that our heart is yearning to want you to be in control, Father God. And Jesus, tonight, if there's anyone here, may they submit their heart to you tonight. And I pray in your name, Jesus, may you turn up in their lives. May you make those changes in their lives. May you answer their prayer in their lives, Father God. We know that you're a faithful God and you're a God that uh, when, whenever we pray, you will answer. So tonight, Lord, we place our treasures, our idols into your hands and we ask you to take it away and instead give us a heart that's like yours. We love you so much, Jesus. We thank you again for the greatest treasure that you did for us. You came, you died, then you rose again. And we claim that promise tonight, Lord. And in that promise is where we find our hope and our financial security. This is our prayer in your wonderful name. Amen. All right. Well, we've been on quite a journey, haven't we? We've covered all kinds of topics and we've only got one to go. Everybody say, oh. oh. But it's going to be one of the best talks yet. And so tomorrow we're going to look forward to hearing about what Jesus has to say about heaven. And so um, be sure not to miss that. Also, if you've got a friend who you think would really benefit from hearing these talks and they have the internet, you can just give them the website and they'll be able to watch all the talks. And so you just go to live stream and type in, so you can go to the website called live stream. And if you just type in Garden City Fellowship, you'll find our page. And then you'll see this, um, the symbol there, the What Jesus Says About logo. Click on that, you'll scroll down and all the different presentations will be there. And they can just watch them as many times as they like, so can you. So that's a free way of everybody getting hold of it. Another way of doing it is if you'd like to, you can um, catch up with Rex and um, try and get him to make you a DVD or CD, which he'll be happy to do as well. So that's some great opportunities there. So in addition to that, um, I just want you to look forward to our new series, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. And the theme of that series is it's a continuation of draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And the scripture tells us that God strengthens those who are fully committed to him. God strengthens those who are fully committed to him. And God is looking for people who will seek after him and who will be fully committed to him and who will follow him. And his plan is to strengthen us in our journey as we connect with him. And so I believe that that's you tonight, that God is wanting to strengthen you. Sometimes life is not easy. We know it too well. Amen? But God's plan is to strengthen those who are fully committed to him. And so we're going to look forward to hearing more about that tomorrow. But um, let's just finish with a prayer tonight. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of your word, the Bible. Thanks for the encouragement of the message that we've had tonight, that we can trust you with our basic human needs, which center often on our finances, and that our ultimate and complete security comes in knowing you, Lord Jesus. Thanks for teaching us so much about this important topic and help us to trust you, Lord, not only with our finances, but with all our lives. Bless us, God, as we claim um, this promise, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. And we want that not only for us, but for all the people in our lives so that everybody can enjoy the future in heaven that we're going to learn about tomorrow. 
So bless us tonight. Thank you for the Sabbath. And we thank you that um, you created us and that you died to pay for our sin and that you're coming back to get us. And we put our trust in you, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, everyone. Have a great night.